Well, welcome again to our Tuesday night Bible study. And as you know, we're going through the book of Habakkuk. I've had a bit of fun this afternoon looking at this. And it's such a, a precious word for us tonight. Um, it's the foundation of our faith. And when I looked at the, the chapter, I didn't get as far as I thought I might, but ultimately what it seems to me is it's a, there's a lesson here. And one of the lessons is God saying, trust me, wait for me, and live for me. Chapter two is where we unpack God's response to the complaints that Habakkuk has made in chapter one. And we don't know how swift the response was. Habakkuk says that he is waiting. He is there on his watch. He says, I will stand upon my watch, set me upon the tower, and I will watch and see what he will say to me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. What was, the ha was Habakkuk looking at? What was all of this all about? In Habakkuk 1, he was complaining about the spiritual state of God's people their lack of morality, their lack of spirituality. And God's answer to that was that he would arouse the army who would punish the people of Judah. Judah will eventually fall to Nebuchadnezzar. But Habakkuk doesn't want the Babylonians to go unpunished either. And so as we move into this section that... Uh, Simon so eloquently gave us last week. Habakkuk is given a double instruction by God. He's told to write the vision and he's told to make it plain on tablets. In the ancient world, there were different methods for recording information. What seems to be mentioned here would be a tablet of wood, which the, the, a metal instrument would be used to engrave, to carve out the words. So that's why it would be the meaning of the word to write or to engrave or to inscribe. Later, the Romans would, um, I guess in a sense, they're probably the first uh, uh, eco-conscious recyclers because if you've used a, a metal instrument an art piece of iron to gouge out your letters well you can't reuse that piece of wood so they invented a system where they put a piece of wood and they made a frame and then they filled it with wax and they said use a to use a piece of bone and using the bone they would carve out the words that were needed to say well, that's great because every time you have a new piece of information to put up in the market, you just remove the old wax and pour some new wax in. I wonder, though, when I read scripture about the way God has inspired scripture. And I'm going to do something very Jewish. And when I read here in Habakkuk 2 and verse uh, 1, write the vision, make it plain on tablets. My mind jumps straight to Jeremiah chapter 17. In fact, Jeremiah 17 was a passage we looked at at our Shabbat service just a couple of weeks ago. And in Jeremiah 17, and verse 1, we read this. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron, with the point of a diamond. It is graven upon the tablet, the table of their heart, and upon the horns of your altars. So here we have this similar picture where the sin 
has been gouged out. It's been engraved, inscribed on the heart. And what's written there is the guilt of sin. Now, that's a very Jewish way of doing things because very often if you hear a verse in the Torah, you will hear a word and that one word makes you jump to its other use to a similar word elsewhere. And that's really what I've just done here. Why does God, though, repeat it back in Habakkuk? Why does he say, write it down, make it plain? When we read it in English, we can see what looks like two very different statements. And it's not. Write the vision and make it plain are both words in Hebrew connected to writing, engraving, or inscribing. But they both have slightly different meanings. One simply means to write it down or to engrave it or to inscribe it. And the second one means to write it down legibly to inscribe it legibly so that the letters are clearly readable, legible in other words. So what he's been told is write the vision, in other words, keep a record of it, but write it in such a way that people can actually read it. My dad's writing, he was a doctor, and like a lot of doctors, he had a scribble. If my dad had ever been asked to write a, a, a notice and put it on a notice board, nobody would ever have been able to read what he wrote because he didn't write legibly. He almost needed a, a translation program to have any idea of what he had written. There's a Targum that says on this verse, write the prophecy and explain it in the book of the law, that he may hasten to obtain wisdom, whoever he is that reads it. It's an interesting little verse that's caused quite a lot of um, debate about the meaning of it. That he may run that reads it. Well, what actually is being said here? Often it's said that it is to be intelligible so as to be easily read by anyone running past. But then maybe it should be that he that runs may read it. Hmm. Perhaps the better sense is that it should be legible so that whoever reads it may run and tell all whom he can the good news of the foe's coming and impending doom and Judah's great deliverance. I thought that was very helpful from one of the commentators that I read. In other words, it's to be inscribed plainly and legibly so that the reader may read it quickly some uh, other other theologians say actually what's meant here is it should be plainly and legibly written so that a reader may run his eye through it quickly and read it don't have to take the time to go through it twice trying to work out what's been written on the piece of wood ultimately whether whichever view we take on this Habakkuk has been told to make sure that all who will see the record of the vision will understand it. This is perhaps the reason that we have the whole of it here written for us in the book of Habakkuk. The world still needs to hear these words. We still have a responsibility to communicate the truth 
that Habakkuk has passed down to us. You see, the words that Habakkuk have passed to us are the words of the revelation that he wrote down. And the fact that he communicated it in a way that was le legible, in other words, understandable, has meant that we're talking about it tonight. And some of the lessons and some of the challenges that are found in these few verses are as relevant for us today as it was for the hearers in Habakkuk's day. And one of the big issues when we look at this is the timing. Poor old Habakkuk, he must have been fit to bust a gut, as they say. He's been burdened and, and worn down and, and concerned by the sin of Israel. He understands God's attitude to sin. And he sees the rebellion and the, the way that God's people are living. And he knows that this must grieve the heart of God. He knows that this will incur divine wrath. He knows that the sin of Israel will bring about the loss of blessing and the discipline of God. He knows his Torah. He knows the law of Moses. He knows the principle of blessings and curses. That God blesses his people when they obey him. And he removes the blessings when they disobey him. And it is the removal of divine blessing and divine protection that allows the evil to flourish around them. It is the removal of God's divine blessings and his divine protection that means that, that and I was thinking about this recently, when we look at particularly Deuteronomy chapter 28, the blessings and the curses, that when there is obedience, the rain will fall, the lambs will lamb, that there, there won't be um, abortions among the animals or even among the women of Israel. Those are the blessings of God. When the people of God choose to walk with God, live with God. And then there are the, the what are called the curses, that when you do not obey me, then you won't have rain and you won't have your, your wives will abort their children and your, your lambs and your ewes and your cows will not bring forth their young easily. And all of it actually goes back to the Garden of Eden. You see, none of the world gets the blessing of God because all of the world is under the judgment of God because of sin of Adam and Eve. And the only way to enjoy the blessings of God are to come into covenant relationship with God. But when we are in covenant relationship with God, we are in a position to enjoy the blessings of God. What did God say to Adam? That it would be with thorns, that it would be with the sweat of his brow, that he would toil for his bread. In other words, the blessing of God is the gift and the grace of God. And the world, all of us to a certain extent, believe that we're entitled to the blessings of God. But the reality is that since the fall in the garden, all of humanity is under the judgment of God and only in the Messiah is that judgment removed. Only in him can we truly partake of eternal blessings. So back in Habakkuk, we have been challenged here, along with Habakkuk, to be able to also communicate, and I and I I felt this quite strongly, that what is the vision that God gives us to communicate? It is the gospel. What is it that we are called to do? We are called to preach the gospel, all of us, each and every one of us. Not just the missionaries and the pastors and the vicars, 
but everyone. We're all called to speak the truth of who Yeshua is and what he has done for us and what he has done for all humanity, to all who will listen to us. And then Habakkuk probably was not very pleased when he heard the next words from the Lord. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. And I think that was what I really felt about the ultimate lesson, which is, trust me. Live for me. Wait for me. Believe in me. Have faith in me. All of these um, thoughts, all of these little lessons come from this passage. The vision that has been given to Habakkuk, the one that he's been told to record, write it down, and make sure that he writes it down legibly for all to be able to read. He's then told it's not for now. He's told that he's going to have to wait for it. But he's also told, in a sense, God saying to him, but listen, Habakkuk, don't worry. It will come. It will surely come. It will not tarry. And so Habakkuk, bless him, has got to face God's divine time. It will not fail, but it will only come at God's appointed time. And I think that he would have been sitting there very impatient. I think he would understand that in order for deliverance to come, there must also be judgment. I think he would probably have liked to skip the judgment and go straight to deliverance. And God is kind of telling him just to take a breath. God's promises, the words that God speaks, they span eternity. Think of scriptures like Yeshua was slain from before the foundation of the earth. When we read in Proverbs and in other places about the work of creation and wisdom, all of that goes back to before humanity existed. There was a period of eternity that existed before the world did. And so we, like Habakkuk, await the fulfillment of many prophecies and many promises. And sometimes it may feel as if we've been waiting forever. The disciples assumed that the return of Messiah would be in their lifetime. 2,000 years on, the Lord is still saying, be patient, he will come at the appointed time. This seeming delay is not God forgetting or God not caring. Our God is a faithful God, he cannot lie. What he has spoken, it will come to pass. But we must face the fact that whether we are praying for the return of Messiah, whether we are praying for the salvation of the Jewish people, things that we know are clearly promised in Scripture, or whether we are praying for the salvation of a family member, or whether we believe that God has made us a promise and we're patiently and prayerfully waiting for it to come to pass. 
The challenge is maintaining hope as we wait. Hope in the storms of life, one commentator headed this chapter. Hope, hope because the vision has an appointed time. The vision has something to say. It comes from God and is truthful. And the call of God upon the lives of those who wait for it is to be patient. I love the older version. And I've kept this one up today. I, I usually use the ESV, but I, I like this older, though it tarry, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. <laughs> the verse says, though it tarry, and ends with, it will not tarry. Well, I feel like the Daleks shouting, does not compute, does not compute, does not compute. How can something that tarries not tarry? And I think it might be that little word, though. Often things feel, it feels like we're waiting for eternity. But the reality is how we experience it. The feeling that we're waiting and we just can't wait for God to do this thing. It isn't slow to come because it comes at God's appointed time. And the Lord who knows the end from the beginning knows when things need to, to come. And there is this promise that because it is God's truth, it is not merely, as someone said, a dead book, a book of words. It is a living word. God's word is sharper than any two-edged sword. God's word is alive. So I kind of felt as I was reading it, just a little bit challenged about my own attitude as I, in this, we've been doing it at Chosen People Ministries, identifying along with um, the Isaiah 62 fast. And it's been hard going. You know, we've had two prayer meetings last week and this week. In the congregation, we've had um, Wednesday night, half hour of prayer, Thursday night, an hour of prayer, Friday night, a half hour of prayer, and Saturday mornings, a half hour of prayer, dedicated to praying for Israel. And at the beginning of this, if you went on Instagram and you typed in Isaiah 62, there were tens of thousands of posts. And as we head into the end, the last week, this evening, there were very few posts that people have were excited about praying at the beginning, but almost three weeks in, well, people are getting weary. It's hard to maintain faith. It's hard not to become discouraged. And I think this is why this word is important. Everything that God says and does reflects his truth. And it will speak. I was really struck by that. And the way in which the New Testament uses this verse. So if we were to pop over to Hebrews, chapter 10 and verse 37, we would find 
this little verse pop up for us. And I, I thought this was really good. I found it really quite helpful. So let me just turn my, my Bible there. Hebrews. Oops. Chapter two. Come on, Bible. Thank you. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 37. In fact, I'm going to read from verse 35. Cast not, I'm going to go back to a modern translation. Let me go back to ESV. There we go. So, therefore, Hebrews 10, verse 35, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. And here we have Habakkuk being quoted here. For, for yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. And what's marvelous is in Habakkuk, the promise, the prophecy, the, the, the vision we read is coming and it will not delay. But when we come over to uh, Hebrews, it becomes personalized to as a reference to the Messiah. And so Habakkuk, his little prophecy about it not it coming to it though it tarry it will come it won't it won't be late god's promises always come on time well the writer to the hebrews picks this little word up and says yet a little while and the coming one will come and will not delay the coming one of course is no doubt as we can see a reference to the messiah and messiah coming comes now, I said earlier that before deliverance, there is judgment. And even in the coming of Yeshua, before his death provides deliverance, there is judgment. There is judgment on sin. There is judgment on death. And his resurrection is the evidence of his victory over these things. But Messiah spoke a lot of interesting things in Matthew 24 about the end time, the persecutions, the overthrow of Jerusalem. And so it's a, a challenging little verse. The writer in the book of Hebrews wants to remind us that God rewards faith and that the true reward of faith is the presence of the living God within us by his spirit. But like the writer, like Habakkuk, I think the writer to the Hebrews wants us to open our eyes of faith and to, to look through the eye of faith to discern Yeshua, to discern him as we both experience him and see him at work in our lives. Yeshua, in his own words, went, spoke to his disciples in John 16, 16 and said, in a little while you will see me no longer. And again, a little while and you will see me. Previously, in, in John 14, verse 19 to 20, he said something similar. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in the Father, that you are in me, 
and I am in you. The will and purpose of God move at his speed according to his will. We may wish that he bring the fulfillment of salvation now. We may wish for the promise. We may hope for the promise that all Israel will be saved to be something that we can see now because we're tired of waiting. We're tired of praying. We're tired of longing. But the prophet said that God's vision, God's word, is never delayed or late. And so we're being asked by God to trust him, to know that his timing in all things is perfect and that he does not lie. I've already quoted or alluded to Numbers 23, 19, that God is not a man that he should lie. Has he said it and will not do it? I like the verse in 1 Samuel 15, 29 that says something very similar. Also, the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should regret. Ultimately, what is the vision that Habakkuk has? So I need to turn back over to Habakkuk chapter 2. And I'm going to jump outside of my um, little bit because I need to quote that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. Chapter 3, verse 13. We read this. Oh, I'm still in Hebrews. No wonder that doesn't look quite right. Let me turn the page over. Apologies. Habakkuk 3. Okay, so we read, you went forth for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the wicked. The previous verse, you marched through the earth with fury. And yet, there is a deliverance that is coming for the people of Israel for the people of Judah but I think the challenge that we we have as we read this is what is the fulfillment of the vision because in chapter 2 in these opening verses we're not actually told I think what began at Sinai I think from the perspective of standing this side of history, we can say that the fulfillment of the vision means that what began in Sinai is fulfilled in Yeshua and will be concluded on the day of his coming when he comes as king to judge the living and the dead. He's going to appear in great glory and majesty. He's going to be made visible in all of his glory and everyone and all peoples and all nations of the earth will see the Son of God coming as the judge. Revelations 1, 7 tells us he's coming on the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All of the tribes on earth will be given, will be held, will wail, sorry, will wail on account of him. So, what is this message that we're being given in the book of Habakkuk? Arthur Pink says that patient endurance is a fruit of faith so that the Christian is enabled to stand firm amid the storms of life. He's commenting on the passage in Hebrews where the writer quotes from Habakkuk and really 
makes the point that he's not translating from Hebrew into Greek, but quoting directly from the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures called the Septuagint that was written about 400 years before uh, the coming of Jesus. And I love the fact that the writer to Hebrews takes the prophecy in Habakkuk and applies it to the Messiah. We then enter the great debate. And the great debate, of course, for both Judaism and Christianity. Are these three little words in Hebrew? The righteous shall live by his faith. In the Talmud, we read that Moses gave Israel 613 commandments. David reduced them to 11 in Psalm 15, Isaiah to six in chapter 33, Micah to three in chapter six, verse eight, Isaiah to two in chapter 56, verse one, but it's Habakkuk who gives one unequivocal commandment that literally reads, the righteous by his faithfulness shall live. Fascinating to think that that one verse is quoted by Paul in Romans 1.17 and again in Galatians 3.11 and also in the passage we've just been looking at in Hebrews 10 verse 38. Someone wrote that this, these three little words are the pivotal axis upon which salvation turns. It is the distillation of all of the Bible's commandments into one essential truth, one essential law. And ultimately what it is telling us is that justification is by faith in God. It is not through works. It's always worth sometimes looking at the Hebrew words. And faith, emunah, is faith that includes action. Faith and belief are two different things. What I believe is what I understand with my mind. What I have put my faith in I'm going to live by. And so if we're going to do this separation between the head and the heart, belief is head knowledge. But faith requires the engagement of my heart because I must live it. I must love it. And so when we ask, what does it mean to live by faith? When we grasp this, we might discover that it's more than obedience. Religion drives obedience. But faithfulness to God is a reflection of a living relationship with God. And the qualities of that relationship, faithfulness and loyalty, the firm, constant, true devotion of the heart. These are important things. The gospel is a reflection of the righteousness of God. And when we think of righteousness, we have to look at the Hebrew word 
and it's to do with a word that comes from Sadak. We say a righteous person is Sadiq. It Sadak is also about correct weights. It is straight paths. It is the right and the correct moral, ethical uh, behavior. It is the right sacrifice at the right time. Um, when talking about the offering of sacrifices, it will be righteousness to us if we take care to do all of these commandments before the Lord our God, as he's commanded us, Deuteronomy 6.22. It will be righteousness if we do all that God has commanded us. So righteousness is human righteousness, that is. It's intended to be a reflection of the righteousness of God. It may surprise us then that the Tzedekot Adonai, the righteous acts of God in the Jewish versions of the Bible, are often translated as kindnesses, benevolence, gracious acts. This is because the word tzedak means more than just legal correctness, it's covenantal faithfulness. Matthew 6 verses 1 to 2, beware of practicing your righteousness, your acts of charity that is, before other people in order to be seen by them, then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. When you give to the needy, sound no trumpet. The purely righteous do not complain about darkness, they increase the light. They don't in complain about evil. They increase justice. They don't complain about heresy, but increase faith. And they don't complain about ignorance. They increase wisdom. This is from uh, Rabbi Abraham uh, Cook and on how to be righteous. Righteousness is ethical, but it's also practical. And functioning as it should, it is always merciful. So what does it mean to live by faith? Ultimately, it reflects a relationship with God. And it speaks of our devotion to God as we journey through life with God. And of course, I said last week or a couple of weeks ago, it was the rally, this, the righteous will live by faith is the rallying cry of the Reformation. I'm really running out of time and I'm going well over, so I, I do need to draw this to a close. But the one thing we need to say about righteousness by faith, apart from the law, you only have to go back to Abraham. Abraham was considered righteous. He was considered righteous before God because he heard God and what he heard he did. He obeyed. There was no Torah. There was no set of legal rules. He just knew that God had spoken and he followed God. Ultimately, to live by faith is not about keeping a set of rules. That's religion. To live by faith is to Really, as I said at the very beginning, it's to trust God, to live for God, to wait for God, and to know that he's never late, that what he has promised, he will bring to pass.